welcome everybody. We're gonna call our meeting to order at 6.19. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, I wanna start by just saying that, you know, we all know that we had an incident at U32 last week. Uh, symbols of hate are not tolerated at our school district. So let's, let's all pause for a minute. And, uh, and remind ourselves of what our values are, who we want to be, who we are, and uh, mostly think about who we want to be. And by, I'm going to do that by reading our humanity and justice statement so we can remind ourselves of what we want to be. And I know that all of you are familiar with it. But the Washington Central Unified Union School District is dedicated to taking concrete actions that provide a safer and more supportive learning environment that is free of barriers, one that affirms the identity of each of us and acknowledges and celebrates the difference to create a sense of belonging for each person connected to our schools. The school district is committed to creating inclusive educational opportunities that are relevant both historically and culturally, addressing the impacts of bias, prejudice, and discrimination while building more opportunity for us to rather than merely survive. This statement represents a commitment within our school district to acknowledge and end oppression and oppressive systems, to center our full humanity of all in our community, and to keep broadening our perspective. These identities, including and not limited to race, color, religion, creed, nation, national origin, ethnicity, mar mar marital status, family, composition, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, Varying physical and mental abilities and socioeconomic status carry a socially constructed meaning and value. Our commitment is to the development of cultural humility and personal growth that is best supported in a climate that respects differences and provides a sense of belonging and inclusion. So with that, I wanted to welcome all of you here and just make us think and pause for a minute, but also allow us to introduce ourselves today because we have a couple of new members and then we'll do the adjustments to the agenda, et cetera. So I'm gonna start with our students and, and then we can go from Jonathan all the way down. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm Laura, I'm the senior representative. And then- My name is Linnea and I'm the junior representative. Welcome. Amelia Mendez Contrada, board member from East Montpelier. Healy Sloan, board member from Berlin. I'm Megan Roy, superintendent. Flor Diaz Smith, chair of the board, East Montpelier. Uh, Joshua Stevitz. Joshua Sevitz, board member, Middlesex. I'm Kari Bradley, um, board member from Cal. Daniel Beebe, board member from Callis. Ursula Stanley, board member from Middlesex. Uh, Jonas Ian Van Fleet, and I live just over the Middlesex town line in Worcester. Zach Sullivan, board member from East Montpelier. Diane Nichols Fleming, board member from Berlin. Great. Thank you, everybody. And that's true. Natasha, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, uh, Natasha Eckhart, board member from Worcester. Okay, yeah, so that was Natasha. It was hard to hear, but we'll we'll figure that out. Okay. And we have, so welcome. We have some people on Zoom and we have some of our administrators and Mark with us tonight. Thank you for being here with us. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Hearing none, we're gonna move on. Uh, any public comments? On the Zoom, any public comments? Please raise your hand. Seeing none, I'm gonna move on. Uh, and just, yeah. This might be adjustment, but I think these two have a report to make to us. I don't see it on the report. Oh, oh, you're absolutely right. Wow. Sorry, the, the should we start with that? Yeah, why don't we start with that? Since we have, can you? Um, last week we had a pep rally. Um, there was great student participation. Every varsity team did a dance, and the juniors, which is my class, um, we won the class holiday wars. So our sports have been pretty consistent. 
consistent, especially with the girls' soccer team. We're at an 8-0 streak right now where we haven't lost, knock on wood. Um, the boys just won their PA game, a 1-0 game. Field hockey is also undefeated. Football during our homecoming just beat MMU. And there's just a lot more excitement around Pep Squad, especially has really tried to bring everyone into the sports and also everyone into the community more to bring in more participation with, like what I said, the Pep Rally, but also to show up for each other and support each other. Um, during last week, the N-word was written on the lockers by some of the students at U32. This incident sparked conversation throughout the student body and faculty. And these conversations consisted of like discussion on how to better deal with these issues among our community. Um, so our school <laughs> had Orange Shirt Day, where it was last Friday, and Blam did scheduled a walkout addressing the Indian residential school system in Canada. And they did this through the Friday morning of last week. And they talked about the residential school system, and we did a moment of silence. Some students talked about their history, their family's history, about these schools, and it was very inspiring. And it's great that our BLAM is really taking action and bringing a lot of these issues forward for us to ex like experience. Yeah. Um, there's a new cell phone policy that prevents students from using their phones during classes and throughout the day. Um, seniors are figuring out future plans. So next week, if you have any seniors that you know, the 11th is going to be with our um, counselors and they have a meeting that will go over college applications and just kind of future outside of high school and what life is going to look like and what it can look like for these individuals. And that is all we have right now. Thank you. Are there any questions for our students? I have one. Go ahead. I'm curious about the student reaction to the new cell phone policy. Get me to it. Not good. <laughs> Sorry, I'm good. Um, I think I think it was a necessary step, especially with just how much advantage students took with just the non-policy. I think it's definitely an adjustment, and but the schools really. Hitting us hard with this one. A lot of students aren't really enjoying it. <laughs> There's a um so if we get caught using our phones during class or like around the hallways, um, you have three strikes. So the first time, well, they they take your phone every time, but each time they take it, you have you have like a strike on IC and then they send out an email to your parents and it's and the other teachers. Yeah, and all of the teachers. So it's it's a big challenge. <laughs> But I think so far, I think in my classes, I'm sure with yours, it's kids are responding well and they're actually in class and yeah. focusing. Obviously, yeah. there's a slip up here and there, but I think it's an overall positive experience. I think it was definitely something that needed to be implemented because it's just kind of, kind of crazy. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Diane. Uh, how has the start of the year felt? I mean, as you've been progressing through in your career here, um, how has it uh, felt this year from the start? The pain, the kind of Busy. I know for me personally, it's just been, there's so, so many things to do in such a little time. So 24 hours is not that many hours. <laughs> um, but just, I think the support I personally get from like the faculty in our school is just so like there's such a community that I know Steven and Jess really like enforce is because it is we are each other's like family and like we help each other out and I think this, the teachers especially really want students to succeed so they have been taking a lot of steps to support to enforce and all of you I totally agree with Will I feel like well, if I've ever had difficulty in class, it's just really easy to get help for me in like free bands or callback or whatever. And just the way a bunch of the teachers communicate with students is it's just really helpful and it's really supportive. So overall, good. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so you have you 
I mean, you should talk about that. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, <laughs> I think the parking lot's a lot nicer. The traffic flow, as long as, long as you don't get to school late, like, it's not bad. Also, just the... No. <laughs> I tried very hard not to. <laughs> Same. <laughs> I, have, I have a little sister who doesn't. I think the traffic outside of school right now, like at least in the beginning, it was really hard because there was just a lot of um fixing with the roads. Yeah, and it's definitely got better. This yeah. the the first couple of weeks it was tough. The first week of school, there like there wasn't a back parking lot, <laughs> so we only had the front parking. So I always get there like fifteen minutes early so I could find a parking spot. So that was, but otherwise it's good. It's gotten a lot better. It's nicer, for sure. Okay, great. Thank you. It's great to have you both now with us. So let's move on into our next item, which is our presentation of social emotional learning. So I'm turning it over to Caroline, but just sort of framing for the board, we, we did rotate last year, and this year we're adding the addition of hearing a little bit about what's happening within our individual schools. Caroline gets to gets to go first, which is great. She gets to set the tone. If I don't use the microphone and if people aren't being hearing through the owl, that's cool. People thought it was the Okay. Okay. Can I can move back to you, Karen, just in case I'm gonna mess up. Okay. All right, so for social for social emotional learning, it all, it always starts, it's similar to all systems that we do that are multi-layered. And so for layer one, that is available to all students. Um, and the layer one supports we have are our classroom teachers, school counselors, and our student support specialist. Um, and some of the things that we've done at layer one is we have a consistent person that is at both recesses five days a week. Um, and a consistent person who is at both of our lunches five days a week and having one person, they're not the only ones who are there, the others rotate, but having one person um, really has consistency around expectations um, and students very easily know what to expect each, um, each time they go in and uh, that helps uh, kids because then there's no surprises, um, both for the students and for the adults. Um, and our school counselor leads weekly developmental guidance lessons in each classroom. At Rumney, we call them guidance class. Um, and they are focused on exploring typical challenges and skills for students that are appropriate for their level of development. Um, some of the topics include, but are not limited to, emotions, coping skills, stress management, conflict resolution, um, one of the things that she uses is, this is a poster that might be a little hard to see from where you are, but it's called Kelso's Choice. And if it's a small problem, students are taught to pick one of these strategies. So a strategy might be to go to another game, um, to talk it out, to wait and cool off. Um, and then they also are taught that, it taught that if it's a big problem, then they need to go to an adult. Um, and so all of those lessons are considered layer one, they're for all students, and they are consistent throughout, um, throughout the school year. Um, we have a student support specialist that knows um, you know, students, so our student support specialist is out at every recess, greets the buses each morning. Um, so if students ever have an issue on the bus, they know exactly who to go to. It's somebody who's accessible and visible. And that has made a really big difference in ensuring um, safe bus rides. We have fewer bus behaviors than we did compared to um, three to five years ago. So then, so those were all layer one supports. Then as we move on to layer two, it's all the supports that are in layer one are also available um, in layer two. And we have a student advocacy team that meets each week. And the team includes our school nurse, myself as principal, um, the student support specialist, and the school counselor. And when we meet, we have in-depth conversations around issues that we're seeing bubble up around school. Um, sometimes it's around specific students that we want to check in about. 
And it's great because we um, all come with a different lens. We're a little bit of a diverse group in terms of our thinking style, our communication style. Um, and so it really helps to uh, make plans from that, that have lots of different perspectives. And um, we have a lot of trust on that team. And so we can be honest and we can go deep in terms of the discussions and the problem, solvings that, the problem solving that we do. So then layer two and three, this really focuses more on um, the, the adults that are involved in those layers are the behavior support specialist, uh, myself as principal, and the special <coughs> educators. So for this, I have a little handout. I was really trying not to have to rely on technology. Um, but for students who really need the layer two and layer three, it's really about, um, these are students who have a lot of in terms of emotion. And if you look, this is the picture I'm passing out. It's an emotion, it's a behavior iceberg. And the behaviors are what we see. And the emotions are um, what they feel and what we can't see. And so, so what we do with layers one and two, utilizing the staff that I mentioned, is we try to catch kids when we see some of these behaviors. We try to get to the root of it, what could be um, you know, some of the emotions that they're experiencing. So if one of you wants to pick an emotion and a behavior, that might go with that emotion. I could give you some examples of things we would do. Any volunteers to pick one of the emotions that's under the iceberg? Embarrassed. Yeah. Embarrassed. 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 Yeah. So, and often with um, kids, it's more than one, right? So it might be embarrassed and then quickly go to overwhelm. So some of the things we see um, from certain students who are struggling is that um, they might uh, run or flee, they might have uh, aggression or raging. So for those students, um, some of the things we have is um, we have a reset room, which is actually right there. And I have some bins. These are bins that usually are not in my cart. They're usually in the room. So each bin, we have, there's actually more than this, but I grabbed just a couple. There's stretchy, bubbly, heavy, and Lego. All right, so I'm gonna pass some of these out. We get stretchy. All right, so pull out what's in it, and I'll tell you what we would do. Not the bubbles. If you pass them all the way down to Josh. Okay, the heavy one goes here. Oh, you're lucky, you get the legs. Just be careful with the mics. Okay, so in the reset room, students go, they get to pick the bins. And if you look, so, so this bin would help, um, they stretch, and then it helps with students with sensory, it gives some pressure. While students are utilizing these bins, anybody who's assisting them is assessing, is this getting them more calm or is it elevating them? If it's starting to elevate them, we would quickly switch the bins. <laughs> um, but anybody who responds, um, we have lots of tools. So, that's, so the reset room is one space. There's also a calm office. The calm office, you passed on your way in. It's a room that has pillows, stuffies, um, and other than that, it's basically empty. That's a space for kids to go um, if they either flee or if um, they maybe scream. Um, they would go to that space, and that way they can do those things safely and get de-escalated and check in with, um, with a staff member. One of the things that's really important in both spaces is that they have big windows um, because intervention should not be private or secret. And even kids who are needing um, intervention for big emotions 
it's okay for other kids to see what, um, what interventions we use. Sometimes kids do ask for privacy, and obviously, if they're crying or they have an emotion that they, is not safe to share, we would um, give them that privacy. So this is our response folder. There's a sheet on one side that's for the adults. We use the three C's, which is calm. As the adult, take a deep breath and remember, a dysregulated adult cannot help regulate a dysregulated child. Prompt, calm down activity. Connect, praise for taking the necessary steps to calm body. Validate feelings, make a reflective statement. I can see you're really upset and I'm here to help you. Consequence, talk through what happened, what would be done differently, and how it affected others. If a repair is needed, decide what it will be. So those three things are really important because students need to have a consistent follow-up to any behavior that goes beyond the classroom. They, know, they need to know what to expect, do the same thing each time, make a repair so they can continue to be and feel like part of their classroom community. Um, let's see, I wanna pull out one more. Okay, so tell me about what you picked. Anybody have one that they felt calmed them? Anybody have one that they felt like gave them more energy? Anybody not play with the toys at all? Um, Will and I got oh, sorry, sorry. Will and I got this thing, which is stretchy, and um, I feel like it gave me a little bit more energy. Yeah, it's fun to play with. So times that we would want somebody to have more energy is if they were feeling really low, and sometimes when kids have big feelings, they go very low. And what we have found, and we implemented um, probably now two <coughs> years ago, was when there's a kid who's low and wanting to talk and process with adult, anytime we can get them to move and process is better, and anytime we can get them, you know, whether it's a stretchy, whether it's um, one of the bands, it really helps get them um, even just one step closer to um, I don't know, to, to being like happier, more able to access their learning um, than if they were to sit and talk. They, some kids, that makes them go actually lower. Um, and so knowing what makes somebody have more energy, there would be a time when we use that. And um, the, it could be a, the same student also needs times um, when their energy level comes down. So. But um, the behavior iceberg has been really helpful in terms of talking with staff when we're talking about students. We start here in terms of conversation because these are the behaviors we see. And then as we're problem solving, we need to identify, and this is really a best guess when we're in the early stages, is what is the emotion and what are the things we can do to go along with the emotion, especially one like embarrassment. So students um, you know, who struggle if they're being asked to read aloud, could be a reason you might feel embarrassed in a classroom. Um, so, yeah, Willa. I think with this one especially, you can even look at what happened in our school last week, is some kids wrote the N-word on our lockers, and where, what we see is obviously this part, but what we don't see is how they're actually feeling, and I think if this can go into more schools and this idea of what's actually happening to a student, the adults that they turn into will be overall more supportive of humans. So, good job. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Willow. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you for sharing with us. Oh, you're welcome. We hope everybody got some food. Yes. Okay, we're going to move now into our board learning. We're really excited when that may introduce Mark, but I see, you know, as a, as a board, one of the things that we're committing is committed to learning together. So it's kind of an opportunity, and we had some feedback after our retreat, and, and uh, we shall look forward manual, so it is in response to that. So Megan, you sure. want to introduce Mark? Yep, thank you for that. And um, I, I would just piggyback on it and 
we were fortunate to have space in our agenda, frankly. We weren't sure coming out of that retreat, um, and we did. So um, I introduce Mark McDermott. He'll tell you a little bit about himself. He's an attorney with Linland, Blackman, and Minsky. Um, and he's, gonna, he's got some things to share and is welcoming a conversation. So plenty of discussion. We sort of talked a little bit, shared what we discussed at the retreat. So that's what he's framed the presentation around. But obviously, um, it'll Go where you need it to go. Hi, I'm doing the worst part. Uh, fooling with technology, it's very self-conscious. I'd rather you ask me very personal questions than watch me do this. We have one Legos one. to play with. <laughs> 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 Hang on one well, Spencer is there. Yeah. 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 personnel policy and legal services. Uh, and prior to that, I was board chair at Charlotte. I was on the board in Charlotte. I served on the board at Champlain Valley School District, at the Chicken and South Supervisory Union, and on the Act 46 committee that made that all necessary.
and come hear you. A, a lot of what you're here tonight, open meeting laws, will touch on public records uh, uh, requests. Um, the public is involved in the business of the school through you, and therefore they have a right to know what's going on. And that's what these all point to. Sorry, I just the uh, Zoom froze. Okay. So, yeah, it's not showing okay. the presentation. All right, so I take back everything I said about technology. Yeah, it. Uh, where the heck was it? I never used PowerPoint. Oh, uh, just it... something. Right, how about now? Yeah, that's good. Okay. I can get I can get to where I need to look. Let me try one other thing. Okay. I think it's just Zoom and PowerPoint hating each they put other. Me on the seven second delay that they have for um, live, you know, just in case. Yeah. We're always uh, I'm gonna say if I have them, if we do this. Sure. I can give you a wireless one if you want. No, it's fine. I'll stand. I'll stand here. It's probably better. That's probably better. Anyway. Yes. I can. Uh, I can. Either. Is this okay? I just can't stand in front of that. Maybe I'll take that. Just because I can't stand. Here. You gave me a microphone. That was dangerous. So. For yeah. Support, the Zoom. Yeah, it's showing this. Oh, is it? That's all right. That's fine. That's uh, you don't it, have any dirty secrets. No, no, no. It's just the it's just showing. If we get calls tomorrow, okay. we'll discuss it. Okay. Uh, okay. So when are you having a meeting that needs to conform to open meeting laws? We talked about it a little bit. When you have a quorum. You have a big board, but you know if half of you get together, you're in a meeting. You're in a meeting if you're talking about the business or taking action of what you do. So if you're talking about school business, if you're taking action regarding school business in a quorum, not a meeting, social gatherings, conventions, trainings, which is big. Uh, uh, technically, if it was just me tonight and you weren't doing other business, you could have called this not a meeting and not warned it and, and that sort of thing, just a training. Yeah. Um, and again, not discussing your other business. Okay, so here's me asking you questions. Sally Super, the superintendent, organizes a board retreat. At the retreat, um, the members listen to and participate in a session put on by VSBA, it includes roles and responsibilities and goal planning for the board. Tom Troublemaker sends an email to Sally stating, you didn't warn your meeting, I wanted to be there, you're going to OML jail. Is he, are you really in trouble? No, it's a training. Speak up, you can yell, you're right. There are no wrong answers here, unless you said yes, you're in trouble. One more time, the entire board attends a conference they're excited by what they hear, and over lunch, the board sits together and discusses the topic and how it would be excellent to make it onto an agenda for the next meeting. One member suggests that it be specific to professional development training for teachers. The rest of the members not in agreement, and the board chair says, we'll put it on the agenda and then move for a vote at next meeting. Did you just have a meeting? There are no wrong answers. That's a wrong answer. It, uh, you went uh, one step too far. You can discuss what you during the training, but you've just made a decision about how that's going to look without public input or without the public having the chance for input. Does that make sense? Yes. You were all set, even even when you discussed putting it on the next agenda, you were okay. It's when you took it from putting it on the next agenda to let's put it on the next agenda formulated this way. You've made a decision. Yes, 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 you've made a 
decision that it should be a teacher's public development, uh, uh, professional development class. Is that squirrely? Yes. I'm not saying it's easy. If you didn't, if, if then that discussion then happens at the next board meeting, then you're okay. Again, it, are the OML police going to drop out of helicopters? No, but it, it, it's the public being able to comment on what you're doing, having the chance, right? Sorry, there was a hint. Yeah, so that's not a quorum. Yep. Yep. Good question. Yep. Well, they're descript, but they're not detailed. So if we end up having this discussion after the public comment meeting, the public doesn't have a chance to weigh in or comment on what we're talking about, what's is that a problem? If I get your question, yes. Um, if you're discussing business or making decisions in a group that's larger than half of this board, um, you're, you're having a meeting. So my, my question is going more to the public comment part that you, yes. you referenced. Oh, we have public comment before the meeting starts. Yeah. Like at the very beginning of the meeting. The yep. meeting started, public comment at the beginning. Uh, they can comment on anything, I think, in the agenda. Yes. Is that sufficient to meet that criteria? So also, as you're going along and there's discussion topics, the public should be able to weigh in when you're discussing at that time as we go along as you go along but only but only you know so the public typically the public comment at the top of the agenda is sort of for uh, the public to comment on things that aren't necessarily on the agenda mm -hmm. so they're bringing things to you you don't have to answer their questions back we're actually going to talk about this a little bit uh, then as you go through the agenda uh, you have a you have the budget on there and somebody wants to discuss the budget at that time there's usually a chance there for the public to comment Okay. But Thank there's you. little leeway on how that operates. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I must have pushed the button as I was going along here. Uh, how to protect the public's right to attend. So again, the public has a right to attend your meetings. Um, that's why we warned them. That's why you took a, a vote on a regular meeting schedule. Um, Decisions of the board are made in open session. That means people get to see what you're doing. Uh, you must have an agenda that's made available prior to the meeting if it's requested. Meetings must be warned if they're not. Right. This is uh, uh, what we're having tonight is a regular meeting. Uh, I'm guessing you have a uh, uh, a meeting the second. What is it? The first Tuesday of the month. I don't know what today is. First Wednesday. Uh, it, it, that's a regular meeting that doesn't need to get a separate warning. This is when you normally meet. We're gonna talk about special meetings and emergency meetings in just a little bit. Look, right there. So there's two other types of meetings. A special meeting is for things that can't wait or things that happen along the way towards a regular meeting. You wanna hire a superintendent. Those can get warned in 24 hours and then you can have a meeting. Emergency meetings are different. That's when there can't be any delay. Uh, a building burns down and the kids need to know where to go tomorrow. And the board needs to get together to fund it or figure that out. That could be an emergency meeting that can be done without a warning and can be done almost immediately in less than 24 hours. So this little situation here is the superintendent has developed a drinking habit. He's been calling employees in the middle of the night and using foul language. The board chair finds out on Sunday she's shocked and decides this can't go on, which is probably the right call. <laughs> she calls an emergency meeting for Monday evening. Is that proper? I don't think so. Sunday to Monday. It's a good question. 
I would say if you can wait to Monday evening and you found out on Sunday, that's a special meeting. There should be a warning um, mm -hmm. and you can go on. Now, in this case, it would be personnel decision discussion. So it might be an executive session, which is a whole other question, which we'll get to in a minute. Is it complicated? A little bit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I would just say that, I mean, while that's a pretty dire situation, I wouldn't think of that as an emergency, as in a similar vein as a building burning down or some other serious life safety issue that comes yes. up that has to be, that requires an immediate meeting. Yes, I'm agreeing with that. Yes, this uh, special meeting warned 24 hours. Um, uh, emergency meetings, I'd say, are pretty rare. Pretty rare. Of course. Look, the reason I have a job is because we can quibble about what's happening. Yes. 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 Yeah. Could you? And there's a whole host of things that go along with that. Could the employee be put on leave until that meeting happens? Yes. Yep. Who gets to say what? This is what we just talked about. The public is given a reasonable opportunity to express its opinion on matters considered by the public body. That's you. So matters you're considering, not stuff outside. So that's what's on the agenda. Um, there can be there's can be restrictions on who gets to comment to people who actually live in the district. Um, and you can have sort of reasonable rules around public comment. And we'll we'll look at uh, a couple of um, what that could look like. I noticed you have some on your agenda, uh, which is great because that's where they should be. People should be aware that they exist. Yeah. Reasonable rules for public participation. Uh, the rules can't be based on what you're about to talk about. You can't have something on the agenda and come up with rules so that the public, it, it, their comments are funneled in some way. Um, you can limit to a reasonable amount of time. You can require some civility. I'm actually going to go to the next slide because here are some sample public comment rules. These are things that you can come up with. I noticed you come up with uh, at least a few of them. Uh, a reasonable time frame. Speakers have to remain civil. Uh, if you're, if there, it's a public comment period and they're talking about things not on the agenda, you don't have to comment back to the public in that instant. Mm -hmm. You don't have the information to comment back. Um, you can cut them short if they're saying the same thing as everybody else has just said um, within reason. Uh, and everybody should be uh, expected to identify themselves. Okay. So the way the public knows what's going to happen here is the agenda. The agenda gets posted, it gets sent out, um, and that's how people know if they're interested enough to come and talk or watch or send an email to the board about something that's going on. And this is just a quick run through. Uh, you have an agenda setting uh, procedure for the board. Uh, it gets set by the chair. Uh, you have a chance to modify the agenda at the beginning of this meeting. Um, and it talks about how to modify. It requires a majority of the board. You should take a quick vote if, if you're modifying. Uh, now, if we're just adding uh, the report from the students mm -hmm. uh, and you don't take a quick vote, again, there's no OML police, uh, but that, you know, just procedure-wise. Uh, and here, again, the public gets to know what you're doing. Best practices. Um, include a description on, of what you're talking about that's fair specific on the agenda enough so people know what's happening uh, timing on your agenda school boards never stick to the timing on the agenda but it's nice to have and it's nice to look at and it's because some people can't come for the whole meeting and maybe they, they only want to come for a piece of it okay time and location for the meeting and recognize the adjustments i'm not going to spend too much long too long on this but minutes are required um, uh, there are certain form, uh, and, uh, and, and they get posted. I've seen them on your website. The quasi-judicial function. So sometimes a board will sit 
in what's called a quasi-judicial function. This usually happens for boards and student disciplinary hearings. Uh, someone come, uh, a student comes in to be expelled. They're, they are required to have a certain procedure for their due process rights in that, in that setting. And I'd say that's a training unto itself. A board that's getting to that piece should spend 15 minutes beforehand uh, learning what's going on. So uh, you're acting as a mini court in that setting. The person who's brought before you has rights. They have rights to be, they have rights to know what's wrong. They have rights to present witnesses and testimony. Um, and they have rights to hear your decision. Most of these will take place outside of public view in executive session for personnel reasons or student disciplinary reasons. Those are exceptions to open meeting laws. Again, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. I was just talking about this. The due process rights that a, that, uh, a person is afforded in a quasi-judicial proceeding. Um, uh, I'm not gonna, I won't belabor the point. Uh, yes? On the prior slide, in a quasi judicial proceeding, well, it, um, it should be if you if you don't know who the parties are, you're probably not in a quasi judicial proceeding. Uh, it is usually uh, the district or administration and a student, um, the school district and an employee. That's that's why you're in a um, that's why you're in that setting. Uh, I can't think of one off the top of my head because it's usually a personnel or a student issue. I'm, I'm, it's an interesting question. It's an interesting anyone question. outside of the situation? No. So as a board, you negotiate in public, you discuss things in public, and then, and there and and that's a requirement. There are exceptions to that rule, and that's when you go into executive session. Um, there are lots of exceptions. Uh, these are some uh, where you talk about whether there's a specific finding that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public bo body at a disadvantage. And there's you know contracts, labor negotiations. Those are the big ones. And then there's a whole list uh, that where that finding isn't necessary, where you're talking about buying real estate, you don't need to find a disadvantage at first. Um, the most important one for you all is students. Um, anytime you're disciplining a student, you're in an executive session, no one gets to see that. Um, more uh, other executive sessions, uh, usually around contract negotiations with the union or, or planning for those negotiations. Personnel. If you're discussing personnel in any way, you're in executive session. Uh, some rules for going into executive session: you have to take a vote to go into executive session. So people have to agree. Uh, for you, it, it, I, I don't even know why I put this on here. In certain settings, you need two thirds, but for you all, it's a majority. Um, and when you go in, you 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 have to indicate why you're doing it. You know, I. I move we go into executive session for the purpose of discussing contracts or negotiations. Um, your agendas will say something like that. Executive sessions for personnel, executive sessions for negotiations. Um, the public doesn't get to be in the meeting, but they get to know that you're meeting and sort of what it's about. Yes. Yes. All right, so let's see. Uh, this is another uh, I want to make sure people are awake slide. Um, John Smith wishes to challenge the superintendent's residency determination and present sensitive information about his daughter's emotional condition to the board. Should you go into executive session? I'd say this, I, I'm seeing yes and no's, and I'm saying it's a little close, but it because you're discussing a student's uh, status, you would go into executive session. But as a student minor, um, that information is protected by FERPA. 
Well, well, that's different. Yeah. No, if he does it voluntarily, you're not going to get in trouble. But, but I would say as as an uh, this is a board item that's being brought to you as a discussion. See what I'm saying? It's on your agenda. Executive session. Um, maybe that one's a little too cute. Sorry. I'm sorry. I welcome questions and suggestions. Uh, the board is preparing for negotiations and has asked a lawyer to explain how the current contract works in application. Yes. Yeah. I. Yes. That that conversation is going to range into that is strategy for negotiations. Yes. The current the current contract works this way. Do you like it? All right. Well. I, all right. Here's uh, everybody's favorite topic. All right. No, it's my favorite topic. Robert rules of order. Uh, according to statute, uh, you're a, a public body that should operate by Robert's rules of order, and this is so. Um, the, uh, you know, that, that there's a way to operate to keep things moving in a civil direction. Um, all right. So these are the basics it, and you, I've, I've watched you do them, uh, how to make a motion. I move in a, in a large body. And I know it says it on here in a large body, you're supposed to stand up but we'll call you small so you can stay in your seats. Um, another member has to second that motion and then there's discussion. And the chair calls the question at some point. Uh, so, I'm not even gonna, here's a quick cheat sheet. Uh, this is sort of going on. Um, how you finish a meeting? You have to adjourn. You're really supposed to take a vote to adjourn. You aren't supposed to say I adjourn, and everybody run out of the room. Um, uh, you can take a break the same way. You can end debate by saying I move the question, and then there's a second and a vote on whether there should be whether debate should end. Uh, you can do the same with suspending consideration of the matter. That's basically tabling a motion. You can take up a tabled issue that's already been out there. Uh, the Roberts Rules book is this thick. I'm not joking. It's in my bag. The basics are: I make a motion, I second the motion, discussion, action. I have no idea. Hang on. Uh, well, we're actually going to talk about that again. Yeah. Uh, under Robert's rule, the chair has uh, a bunch of duties that they're supposed to take care of. Uh, I'll send this slide just to you. Uh, opening the meeting, announcing the proper order of business, recognizing members who are entitled to the floor. Uh, sort of, it, they act as the MC of the meeting to make sure that it all goes quickly and efficiently. This talks about how to amend a motion. So if a motion is made and you want to change it, you can't just say, let's strike the second sentence. You have to move to amend the motion and then have another discussion. It's almost like having a second motion on the table. And then you adopt the motion as amended or reject the first motion and make a new motion. Uh, this, this happens a lot around budget time uh, when we're discussing numbers and numbers change during the course of the meeting. Uh, you should be amending or presenting new, not just changing on the fly. Uh, this is, I don't know if you call points of order here, but someone can ask for a point of order. Uh, in this uh, scenario, someone who's uh, rambled on a little too long and someone has uh, asked the chair to call a point of order, and the chair has the authority to say, okay, that's enough. And then the person who was chastised can say that's unfair and take it to a vote. 
I'd say that doesn't happen very often on school boards, but it is something that's out there. You can suspend the Roberts rules by vote, two thirds. You can and operate in a different way. I don't suggest it, but it's an option. Uh, you can move. So there's been a long debate about a particular motion and you're sick of it and you can call the question. And you say, I call the question, there's a quote, that, and then there's a vote, and if two thirds of the people agree with you that it's time to vote, you move on to voting. All right, that was the boring stuff, I'm sorry. Yes. So, um, conflicts of interest for school board members. This is, um, this is not from your policy, this is just a, what a conflict should be looked at as. It's where an appearance of benefit for you or even harm in your duties. So a conflict of interest means a situation when a board member's private interests as distinguished from their interests as a member of the public would benefit or be harmed by their actions as a board member. So you're taking you're taking votes all the time that benefit you because you have children at the school. Um, the amount of money that the school raises or doesn't raise, that's all part of it. But when it crosses a line, when you have a business interest in something that's before the board, or uh, it, it, uh, we had on our board, we had uh, spouses of teachers during negotiations who wouldn't recuse themselves because there was a financial benefit. Uh, in in that in that area. Okay, so the, I have looked at your policy A one uh, today. You have a very nice procedure set out for conflicts. Uh, I would say that's actually very well developed uh, compared to other schools. In general, if you think there's a conflict of interest, it should be raised. It should be raised in public. Uh, explain why it's a why you, why it's thought to be a conflict, and the person gets to defend defend themselves. Um, a conflicted board member shouldn't participate in any discussions about what they're conflicted out of. I think that's pretty simple. I would say your baseline should be the appearance of a conflict. That's not written down anywhere. It's just a a way that boards, I think it's a, an obligation of boards to look clean. Here, I could have done a lot of these, but I didn't because I didn't want to, I knew it was gonna to be towards the end, people would be falling asleep. Uh, Bob Driver owns a bus company. He's on the board. He always recuses himself when awarding the bus contract. It's the right thing to do. This time he votes to let the business manager decide. Is that a problem? I think there's an appearance. I This is one where I'd say there's not a wrong answer, but yes, the appearance, it, it'd be really difficult to explain to somebody why you didn't take all those votes and then all of a sudden you're taking a vote on bus contracts, even if it's a vote to let somebody else decide. And actually, in the state of Vermont, this happens a lot, right? Lots of board members, uh, not bus companies, I don't mean that, but, uh, you know, uh, selling food to cafeterias or copiers or um, so it's just something to keep an eye on as you're going through. Um, it comes up, it probably comes up more than you think if you really thought it through. So keep an eye out for it. Okay, this is sort of best practice stuff. Now we're outside. I have no laws to cite. I have no Robert's rules to throw at you. Um, board member interactions with school. I I used to walk into the principal's office, not because my kids were in trouble, because I was in trouble. And um, and the principal would look up and go, Mark, are you here as a parent or a board member? They shouldn't, the administrator in your school shouldn't really have to ask that question. Your contact with the administration should be funneled probably through the board chair or through some procedure that the board agrees with. So there's a delineation between your role on the board and your role as a parent or a community member. 
And sometimes it's hard to remember that. And you will have folks, uh, people that have been on the board for a while, who will ask you, you're on the board, can you do something about X? And you can't do something about X because you are a member of the board, you're not the board. The board can operate as a group, as an individual, you have the power to talk to the board, not to act for the board. Um, a board member should understand the perceptions of their authority. I think I just talked about that. Um, board members should limit their interactions with administration. That doesn't mean that you don't go talk to your principal if your child's in trouble or needs help with something. It means that you have a role as a board member and it should stay outside that, that person's office. There's a different way to contact them. Okay. Is there any questions about that or any comments on that? This is, a, uh, you have a duty of confidentiality. Um, this gets boards in trouble a lot. Um, personnel matters. You're going to learn a lot about people who work for you. It should stay in your head students, and anything you learn in an executive session. I just want, uh, a couple of school districts have gotten in trouble where school board members have spoken out of turn to the press about somebody, about an employee who works for them or was about not to work for them. Um, and it hasn't gone well for them. Uh, I would say, one, if the press is calling you, I, I don't know if you have a procedure for how to handle that in this board, but there should probably be one person on the board that's talking to the press. Don't Just don't comment. It's really not worth it in the end. Um, let's see. I've written a couple things down. I'm at the end of my slideshow. You can clap. Um, Just one, uh, I, I just wanted to mention the Public Records Act. The public has the right to request documents from this board, and they include everything, including your emails. If you email as a group, you're having a meeting if you're discussing things. Okay. I, I know you've probably heard that before. Um, I strongly encourage you to use whatever email has been given to you as a board member for that purpose only and keep it separate. I would strongly urge you not to do things via text because that's another bundle of fish, kettle of fish um, that can get you into trouble. Uh, use that email to set up board meetings to do the ministerial work of the board, but don't have discussions about matters that are going on and don't do it among yourselves either. Um, it's just, it's another way to get in trouble. Do your work here at meetings after it's been warned. Um, do you have any questions for me? Yes. Yep. You don't do it again. Uh, um, I would bring it to the board, uh, board chair's attention. Um, it, again, there are penalties built into the law. Who's enforcing those penalties is unclear. Um, so if it has been broken, you would talk to the board chair. You could go back and correct it. You could, you know, uh, you know, if it's an agenda mistake, you fix the agenda. If it's something that happened at a board meeting that should have happened, uh, outside of an executive session, you have that discussion at the next board meeting, um, something like that. So um, there is not, there is not, there is not. But if you have something in mind, we should talk. Yes. Teachers are, administrators are, Support staff is not quite as clear. Uh, thank you for your attention.
Um, I appreciate it. Thank you. There we go. There. Okay. Thank you, Mark, again. I don't know if you could hear us before. We appreciate your time. Uh, let's move on into our last item on the agenda, and that one is to authorize the chair to sign the Red Cross Building Use Agreement. Uh, we included in the packet, this was an agreement that we had previously just with Callis. And we're, oh, that's true. I'm going to let Megan update us on, yeah, Berlin too. Yeah. Um, it, this is pro forma, mostly, but you are the owners of our building, so this you need to authorize floor to do this. Prior to consolidation, two of our buildings were identified as Red Cross sites, so this agreement would have been signed by those boards. Now they, we need to re-up the agreement, and um, it was previously Callis and Berlin. There, It came up through the request to re-up Callis's, and the recommendation is to um, sign this for all five, all of the elementary schools. Um, they didn't ask to list U32. We're not really sure why, um, but that is what you are authorizing because you are the owners of the buildings. It is the same as before. Um, the basics, you can read it in there, but um, we give them access. They, if they were to damage the building, they have, they are liable. And we are also allowed to say, for example, hey, we really need school to be back in session, you know, like, so we, we can impose some things to make sure that we can operate the buildings. And, and we did consult with Nick, our lawyer too. So he, we went through a series of questions and that's how we came to this. There's not much that we can do to amend, so we can't really get creative. We did ask that question and it has to go back to DC. This is a Red Cross uh, document and I, you know, I don't know how we say no to the Red Cross and we've been doing it. <laughs> so we just wanted to bring to everybody's attention, not sign a document, even if it's pro forma, without having you guys the ability to read it. Just to let it all of that, this is not the exact document that you'll sign because there's more stuff in there about that you did I hear Rob correctly. This is a document that we are gonna we sign. Oh it's it's go back to school. Oh, it has to do with um, the site coordinator. Yeah. We we talked about it with Nick. So because we have a site coordinator in the, I have to have to open that email again. But it's right at the beginning. Uh, hold on a minute. The the use of the facility. Yeah. Uh, this is yeah. The, the owner will designate a facility coordinator to coordinate with the Red Cross manager regarding the use of the facility by the Red Cross. So he said, because we asked that question, and that's what our lawyer said. We just lost another lawyer. Mark is not here. But that that gave us the ability, because they still have to coordinate with our person on the site. Yes, Zach. I believe that they, they left the 32 off in there as I used to volunteer for the Red Cross, and I'm pretty sure they would need to do this shelter. Um, do we have a way of authorizing you to sign for you to make they realize, oh, you took that off? Yeah, yeah, that, that's okay. Usury 2 is already, um, it's not a, sh it's, it's a shelter, but it's considered a uh, I'm looking at you, Stephen, because that's where we had all the flawed stuff, but it's already considered. Uh... We actually asked them and they didn't ask to put it on. I do think you could probably, when you make your motion, say sign agreement as is and sign agreement for you 32 should it be right, um, because I think that would be an intention. I mean, the other thing to remember. We didn't have an agreement for U32 and we had personnel using it as a site. So we do use our buildings, um, but yeah, so it, it is a good point. We're not sure why they left them off. Yeah. But... Um, because the easement that uh, middle site has gives um, the uh, emergency shelter, gives the town access to the emergency shelter of the school. Um, and I think there's potential conflict there um, in terms of the Red Cross uh, superseding uh, what the town may want. And the town has its own emergency management 
um, committee and group. So both Callis and Middlesex have similar easements and yeah. the, and Nick reviewed those easements. In fact, the Red Cross themselves produced, they gave us a copy of those easements as, as a reason why you need to sign this because we have access to these buildings as shelters. So our attorney has looked at both easements and are comfortable with it. In, right. in did, fact, did the, they acknowledge that there's a conflict? No, they're, what they're saying is this is actually um in any in, in a way this is backing up the easement because the easement is saying the town can come and tell us hey we got to use your building as a shelter this is what allows the red cross to do that so when, when it doesn't and, and i don't know the scope to which the red cross would um you know designate a place for as a shelter and say and how broad the invitation would go i'm assuming it would be um all of Washington county if the, if the need arose uh, and I don't, I guess I don't see in here where the town itself can just invoke the, um, where, where the town invoked um, their, their easement rights uh, that um, the Red Cross could not. Yeah, I guess what I would say yeah. is the attorney who reviewed it is aware of both and is comfortable with it, that it is still the board who needs to vote to authorize yeah. the signature. Um, and yeah. I don't think I can give you a more sophisticated answer than our attorney was comfortable with what this allows folks to do. Okay, Chris, is, Chris yep. is, your, is your question, is the scenario that you're thinking of that the town would like to use, needs to use the school as an emergency shelter, yep. but the Red Cross says, no, sorry, we're using it as an emergency shelter, right. and you've got two right. organizations that don't know who's in charge? Uh, no, just... Mm -hmm. Um, well, because yeah. with coming in charge, you have different uh, lines of authority too. Uh, and this, this document it. gives a lot of the line of authority to the Red Cross um, to just um, come in and control this. But it's, it is exactly that conflict that can come into play um, between the town, which has an easement to use the school as, a, as a, an emergency shelter, and the Red Cross. It's exactly that. So do you, do you know if the if towns do or do not have a relationship with the Red Cross, right? Each town has to have like a, a, an emergency committee, right? The emergency safety committee. It is a separate emergency committee that is not um, associated with the Red Cross as far as I know. Not, not associated with the Red Cross, with the Red Cross, but I would imagine would be coordinating with the Red Cross in any emergency scenario. I just don't know that. Um, and and I, I can't think of something that would supersede what I think is the town's easement rights here. Maybe they coordinate, that'd be great. Um, but I, I just think you can ask and ask Megan and Floor, have you spoken to the towns? We haven't spoken to the, we haven't spoken to the towns, so we haven't spoken to the emergency management uh, folks at each town. We can do that before we, we sign the document. But I think what what is most important is what Nick just one minute, Chris. Yeah. Uh, what, what Nick would say is is that under the agreement at Washington Center, we only have to make buildings available to use as a shelter, if feasible. This gives Washington Central some discretion regarding when or whether to allow the Red Cross to occupy a facility. So that would involve us coordinating with the town people, right? So, and then anyways, if the Red Cross was to be providing services, it would be to the community. Like if they would be setting a site in that place, just like what happened right now with the flood, let's, for example, Barry, right? Like they would be serving the population there and having to coordinate with the local with the local folks, and they might have more resources than even our own local uh, emergency management people, right? So, so it is all for help, and so I'm just not trying to dismiss the question. I think it's important. So, why don't we write in then that? Uh... Can I let let me ask the question while you're thinking of yours? Will, will, will you will you just read from the feasibility part? It's okay, the, this is from the coordinator. Yeah, yeah, and this is what in paragraph one. I'm reading you what Nick said to us. I would also want to point out and note for the board that under paragraph one, under the agreement, Washington Central will only have to make the building available to use as a shelter if feasible. This gives you some discretion regarding when and whether to allow the Red Cross to use or occupy the facility, which means if your your town management group, you know, needed it first, we would have that conversation and say, 
Uh, well, I mean, if mm -hmm. you, what we include there, if uh, feasible, based on conversation with local emergency. We can't change anything. We tried. We wanted to put a clause. We can't change anything. So what he said is fine to sign the agreement without adding any language about state law and controlling. If we want to change any language into this document, it has to go back to D.C. This is not a document that we produce in Vermont. It's a it's a federal document. So when we talk to the lawyer it, that sent us this federally, that's what he said. We wanted to add a couple of, of little things that said under Vermont law and you know like we were also creative like you but it's not that simple mm -hmm. oh and then sec. you go mm -hmm. um, this may be a bit of a dumb question but I just want to clarify there's no dumb questions <laughs> <laughs> during the board you can ask any question you want okay so. um if you or if we do sign this um like agreement for the Red Cross does that give them priority to use the building over us like over, that's the, yeah. is that what you're talking about? That's that it, but but it does. But you can coordinate that. Exactly. That, that, you can condition it for some period of time. Like saying school starts up in ten days and you have to be out. Um, and that's what I was trying to say by that. What okay. the lawyer said, we still get to call the shots. Okay. Basically. I just wanted to like clarify, and I shouldn't use that word, anyways. Sac okay. and then McKellen and then sure. Ursula. This is to speak to one of Chris's concerns. You know, in practice, the Red Cross does always coordinate with local emergency management. Um, the other piece of this is in terms of who you want running your shelter. Mm -hmm. The Red Cross does take a lot of authority over the shelter. They also take responsibility for damage done to the shelter. Mm -hmm. And stuff does get damaged in shelters. So it's, it, it, is a, it is a very nice thing to have the American National Red Cross financially responsible for the building while they have it. Well, we should also recognize that the clause talks about FEMA and if FEMA is available, and then you have to go for FEMA to get reimbursed to them and not from the Red Cross. It's a, it's, it's a convoluted reimbursement process at times. It's, it's a repo that the fine print at the end. It's not always can you a, a, hold the, I'm sorry. Uh, can you hold the thought for sure, just a minute? Sorry. Because I sorry. think it was it was McKinnon's and then Ursula, and then you can have a second. I'm just curious if this creates a pathway for getting a generator in Dewey. We already have that in the works. Yeah, it's so, in the works. So, well, okay. but I, I would make that connection. We voluntarily move forward with a generator for Doty for lots of reasons because we need them. And we are also would benefit from also calling it a Red Cross site because they may share in the costs. We moved it forward so we didn't have to wait. But yes, this would be advantageous. Thank you. Ursula. I guess I wanted to ask Chris if yeah. your concern is that people are the coordinator for us. We are the owner of these buildings. The person designated as a coordinator would fail to coordinate with the town. Uh, you know, it's not nefarious at all. It's just a matter of who has the right to do what, when, and uh, under our easement, the town has the right to use this building as, a, as an emergency shelter. And the last thing we need in terms of an emergency is having two entities conflict over who can use the as an emergency shelter. Which flag is really important. You said it's not a mandate. It doesn't mm -hmm. say that the Red Cross you know, is going to come in and take control of it. And our facilities coordinator, wherever we decide, is going to make that decision. We, as the owners of the facility, are going to be in charge of the person who makes the decision of who's in charge. Right? So if, if we decide that if the Red Cross comes in and we don't like it to look at that, right, we can, we can <laughs> tell them to come in and we can take their job in this kind of middle sense. Right, that is perfectly within our rights. So, wait, wait, wait. Go ahead, one, sorry, one, sorry. Can, you, can you just raise your hands yeah, yeah, for me? Yeah, hey, Daniel. This is a great debate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was going to be like 10 minutes, and now we're. <laughs> I was I just going to say, I'm comfortable with it because I think as the holder of an easement, the town would have sort of the rights of an owner to determine that feasibility. And and if our coordinator also runs runs whether it's feasible to allow the American National Red Cross into the space by the town, you know, they, they could exercise that discretion and that and that judgment call. That's all in that first term. They could have feasibly So Chris, unless you have your hand up, I'm gonna give it to Jonas. I will say sure. that without having the easement in front of us, but having had it looked at by the lawyers, uh -huh. I would imagine that it's not a concern, right? That that this, the town of Middlesex also doesn't have the right. 
to come to us and say, whenever they want to, we're using this as an emergency shelter. There are terms and conditions and clauses, and we probably have a right, right to coordinate that if it's feasible. Yeah. So. Willow. I, I guess my question to all of you is, if there's an emergency that is present, will you guys be the people that bring in the people that need help or the people that push for? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, if you don't like to work at the Red Cross, like I said. <laughs> We don't like the good, but thank you, Willow, for bringing us back. Keep in mind, we're all people. Yeah. This is supposed to be good. a community. Yeah. And if we don't bring in each other when we desperately need it, and I understand both points, I truly do, but when there is conflict and when there is like problems, which side are you going to be on? The side where you take in the people that you consider your community, or are you going to take in what you think is the priority? <laughs> no. Ursula. I wanted to say I appreciated Willow's comment, and I would like to call the question. I, I think we need to vote on calling the question as debate. So, uh, 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 second, we need a second. So, Jonas. And no debate. Okay, Jonas, second. Yeah. Okay. Call the question. To call the question, please say aye. Aye. Uh, Any opposed? Nay. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, the motion carries so we can call the question so all of those in a, we need a motion we, because we didn't have a motion no, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> we need a motion yeah i we usually start with a motion but i we started with this so that I, I move we authorize the chair to sign the American Red Cross shelter agreement on behalf of the five schools listed and to also sign an agreement on behalf of U32 if requested. Thank you, Zach. Second. A second. Second by Jonas. This is right there. You got all that. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And I'm going to oppose it not because people shouldn't be taking me, because they still. <laughs> But okay. just to clarify lines of authority. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Any abstains? Seeing none, the motion carries. Thank you, everybody. We can look at our future agenda items. We don't have a smart word out. Our next meeting 18th. is the 18th. It's not in there. Oh. No. And it will be our board budget training. Oh boy. And sort of kicking off that process. Yeah. Kicking off, kicking off that process. Yeah, the budget, the, the budget process. Yes, equality will have a report and discussion too. And Natasha, could you hear us? I'm assuming you're still with us. Okay. Uh, that's, that's all we have. Yeah. Okay, good. That's all we had uh, for tonight. So comments? you are in, uh, yeah, just for, uh, no. and then I don't know if there's any reflection uh, on the board before we do public comment. Ursula. I want to and, welcome our new student member, okay. but also just have appreciation for the involvement of our student members. It's very refreshing. You guys bring that student comment. Thank you. Willa? I don't have a question for all of you. Is Stephen talked to us about going into the elementary schools to talk to the elementary school students and bringing their perspective, but also if I invite any of the board members to come to our high school and talk to the students themselves. And really, you can hear our like reflections on everything, but going into certain classrooms and just starting a conversation on what they want to do better and what they think our school needs to do better. You're going to get a way bigger range of perspective than just two people. So I invite you, and definitely we can talk more about this, but I I genuinely think that that would be a great way to bring more involvement, more involvement of the students and the school board. Thank you, Willow. 
Any other board reflections? Oh, sure. Press the D. Press the D. Yeah, everyone, everyone did it, and it was good. So we needed. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Diane. For the presentation for the meal. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So there's no public comment. There's a couple of people online. I wonder if you have any comments. Seeing no hands up, could I have a motion to adjourn? Jonas, and a second by McKellen. All right. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you, everybody. And thank you again, Caroline, for being a great host.